One of the most important parts of the Castlevania franchise is its music. It is highly recommended that you listen to this documentary using headphones to get the full experience. And, if you would like to check out any of the artists featured in this video, links can be found in the description. It's a dark, dark world, a spooky world that nobody wants to be a part of. A world where one of the greatest and most legendary video game companies of all time take one of the greatest and most legendary video game franchises of all time, sticks its teeth in and sucks the life right from it. We live in a world where the latest games related to the genre-defining Castlevania include light gun arcade games, reboots and erotic pachinko machines. This is what Castlevania has become. Thankfully with the release of endless amounts of classic collections for pretty much every system imaginable along with some rather legendary cameos, the spirit and most importantly the memory of Castlevania lives on. And today, I plan to look at everything Castlevania, and I do mean everything. Castlevania is not only the biggest complete history that I've ever tackled, it's also the most loved. Pumping out more games, reboots, spin-offs, remakes, remasters and compilations than anyone could possibly imagine with the help of Asobi Quang DX's biggest Castlevania collection on the planet, IDJ Slow plan to close the curtains, open the coffin and shove a big old stake through the entire history of Castlevania. So join me as we take a look at who made it in the first place, whatever happened to them, how it got changed significantly from system to system, how and why it changed its own gameplay style several times over, how it ended up becoming one of the most expensive and sought after collections in gaming period, and of course looking at what has become in the most recent of years. This is the complete history of Castlevania. Welcome to Slope's Game Room. And before going ahead, I just want to thank Asobi Quang DX once again for lending me this entire collection for this documentary. This video is not sponsored in any way, shape or form, however if you do want to show support to Quang, the link to his latest Game Boy Color game called Super Jetpack DX can be found in the description. And uh, for all of you people out there wondering what this collection is actually worth, You'll have to wait until the end of the video to find that one out. March 1987 was the year that Goonies 2 was released in Japan for Nintendo's Famicom system and has become a bit of a confusing cult classic among retro gamers that gave it the time of day and although we never actually got to see a sequel to Steven Spielberg's classic, we did at least get this. It was of course created by the legendary Konami, the company had made a name for themselves not only in the home on Nintendo's little grey breeze block looking system but in the arcades too. Jackal, Salamander, Double Dribble and my personal favourite Mikey were reasons enough to keep an eye on what this company was releasing. But the Goonies 2? Well that particular game is quite important from a historical point of view, because only one month after its release in April of 1987, the short run Konami based magazine called Monthly Nanda released a little bit of a history and making of that particular game. 
In this article, you can see meetings being had by the team. You can see crew members working on the music for the game. You can see artists working on the front cover design. And most interesting of all, you can see and briefly hear from Mr. Hitoshi Akamatsu. One of the literal godfathers of the video game industry and a gentleman that has never ever been interviewed again before or after this one publication. Why is that exactly? Well, after he gave the world of gaming one of its most important game franchises of all time, well he didn't last all that long and only several years later he vanished never to be heard from again. But... I think we're in fact getting a little ahead of ourselves, so let's go back to the beginning. Which actually was only one year prior in 1986, September 26th 1986 to be exact, the game created before Goonies 2 six and a half month production was the game, like I said, that's going to kick off this episode. After that iconic opening that would quickly become a staple for the series, the game starts off with the iconic first level music, with you, Simon Belmont, or Simon Belmondo as the ending would have you believe, needing to work your way through this colourful yet obviously gothic ripoff of the classic Universal Monster movies of old. Now, please don't take what I just said as a bad thing. It's definitely not. This game is one of the most important and brilliant games of all time, and I stand by that statement. But taking inspiration from the classic horror movies of old is exactly what Hitishu Akamatsu wanted to do from the very, very beginning. It's a perfect night for mystery and horror. The air itself is filled with monsters. <laughs> As already stated, practically nothing has ever surfaced regarding anything that Akamatsu-san had worked on before or after The Goonies 2. Thankfully, however, a developer who was mentored by him did often quiz the gaming genius after this and its two big follow-ups whilst working with him and as recently as 2019, tweeted his conversations which indeed does give us the only real insight into the creation of the original trilogy. Akumatsu really loved film, and when it came to his own creations, he had a film director's eye. He talked about that film feeling a lot. He'd say stuff like, respect the visual frame, and so forth. When I told Akumatsu how great I thought the music for Castlevania was, his reply was, that's because both the visuals and the music were made by people who consciously wanted to do something cinematic. And for his part, he tried to add interesting gameplay. The game at first glance is pretty average. You're a guy with a whip and you gotta get to the end. However, when you go back and play this alongside other titles that may seem very similar within the same genre, there's no denying that it is indeed head and shoulders above the rest. The incredible whip attack, which was taken due to his love of Raiders of the Lost Ark, by the way, is the perfect length attack for behind you and in front of you. If you're good enough, you can actually defeat every boss by just using it. However, the game gives you the option to use several other weapons to flip between on the fly. Oh, and by the way, during development, our hero here that went under the name Peter Dante and the grandson of Christopher Dante didn't just have a whip. He also had some garlic, a wooden stake, and the ability to transform into a werewolf. Obviously, this never happened though. Every projectile that comes your way is different enough, simple enough, and fun enough to be used alongside your whip, and the experimentation of using them against different enemies and in different locations is no longer something you do because you simply have to, you do it because you want to. The original Castlevania did something truly special here that few other action platformers did. Yes, it soaked you into its world of its excellent and easily distinguished enemies and did so whilst pumping incredibly memorable chip tunes into your earlobes, but it did it with precision and it did it with grace. 
Akamatsu San wanted the controls to feel like an extension of the player's own limbs. He wanted you to be able to complete it. Sure, he wanted it to be hard, but he wanted it to be fair and enjoyable. It's a tough mix that very few game developers were able to achieve, but Castlevania definitely did achieve it. Now, I'm not saying the game's not hard, because it is. Some may even say it's Nintendo hard. But thankfully, those tight controls and enemy patterns are all put in a way that makes you quickly realize on every single failure that you are the one to blame. It's tough, but you will thoroughly enjoy mastering everything this title has to offer, because it does everything so well. Originally, the game was developed as a cartridge, but would change mid-development and be released under the name Akamujo Dracula in Japan on the Famicom Disk System. This was before it was ported to the MSX2 home computer in Japan and Europe under the name Vampire Killer, before the original was finally released in cartridge form back in Japan, again this time with an easy mode, and of course for the rest of the world too, where it got its name, Castlevania. For the most part, this difference between the name changes would stay true in the vast majority of ports of this game, even to this day. And the reason for this was because the head of Konami in America wasn't too happy with the translation of Akamujo Dracula, which by the way, loosely translates to Devil Castle Dracula or Dracula Satanic Castle, depending on who you speak to. Fair play. ドラキュラ伝説にピリオドを打つのは君だ。コナミからついに登場。ファミコンディスクシステム要素と悪魔城ドラキュラ好評発売中。コナミ。Now, obviously, there are plenty of differences between these games, especially between the MSX2 and the original, and I'm not going to be getting too deep with them, otherwise we'll be here all day. The big differences between these two releases is that the MSX2 release is a lot less linear, and to many, this is the first true Castlevania, or dare I say it, Metroidvania. Styled title. More exploration is required, more puzzles need to be cracked. Vampire Killer to many is actually believed by many to be the first proper sequel to the original rather than just a simple port. But is it? Is it actually a port or a sequel? Well, considering Vampire Killer came out literally only a month after the original, it's obvious that both were in development at the same time by two different groups of individuals that worked at Konami. Some people even believe that it was actually this game that came first with a more typical action oriented game being developed for the NES afterwards. But considering we don't actually have any proof of that, we're just going to stick with Vampire Killer being the first true sequel to Castlevania and not the other way around. The North American release of Castlevania was kind of a big deal. And that's putting it lightly. The game got ported numerous times and became an instant classic for the system. If you had an NES back in the day, which most people did back then in the States, it's likely that at the very least you knew what Castlevania was. Heck, even computer users couldn't get away from it. As these big and beautiful box versions of the game that just so happened to be some of the most expensive to get hold of in the entire set got their own port, but honestly, besides having the sexy exterior, they don't have much else going for them. They're nice to have, but rubbish to play. These all have redrawn sprites and slight tweaks to each gameplay variant, only really worth playing it if you are a hardcore vampire killing Castlevania obsessive that wants to play several inferior releases. And then you got Versus Castlevania, which hit the arcades and was actually even more difficult with a tighter time limit, more hit points from enemies, fewer bonus points being given, you know, all of that usual arcadey stuff. And if you can't find this game or the bootleg for it, which really is such an awesome bootleg by the way to own, especially if you get the one literally covered in dip switches, you can always trust the good old PlayChoice 10 unit, although word of warning, this board is actually pretty hard to find. 
And although we are going to be jumping ahead a little bit here, I think now is the perfect time to talk about the Sharp X68000 port that got released in 1993 and its port on the PlayStation on Castlevania Chronicles. This title was completely redesigned. Several stages and elements are of course lifted directly from the Famicom Disk System title, but as you are about to see, as this was released after several other more refined Castlevania titles, the Sharp X68000 and even more so on the PlayStation, plenty of elements that work better in newer games are also added into this one. Hideo Yuda, who was the lead on the game, had this to say about its development. Our basic idea for Akumajo Dracula X68000 was an updated, more beautiful version of the original Famicom game, and contending with that was where most of our struggles lied. We didn't want people to see the finished game and say, what the hell? This is supposed to be an X68000 game? Preventing that was something we worked on at every stage, from early planning to the fine tuning. It's fair to say that with the remix stages, the added elements from future games, mixed up graphics and the ability to choose different soundtrack variations makes this title more of a remixed entry in the franchise, taking what Super Mario All-Stars did and cranking the dial up just one more notch. Anyway, back to 1987 with the release of the NES sequel, Simon's Quest. You left him for dead in Konami's Castlevania. How foolish to presume he perished without leaving a curse. For now, in Simon's quest for Nintendo, fate stalks your very being. And you need more than clues from cowardly villagers to survive when day turns into night. But just keep telling yourself it's only a video game. It's only a... Huh? <laughs> Seven years had passed since the last game, and in this one, released for both the original NES and, of course, the much desired Famicom Disk System, Simon Belmont, or Belmondo if you prefer, needs to make his way through the game in order to collect all of the scattered pieces of Dracula's body needed to burn them and then, by doing so, remove a dreadful curse. Unlike the original that required you to simply go from left to right fighting a boss man at the end of different stages in this one, which was inspired by the MSX title The Maze of Gallius Nightmare 2 by the way, you gotta choose your own path. Now this may seem pretty standard now as two out of three new indie games release follow this formula, but for the time it was a risky move by Konami. They had a surefire hit on their hands with the original, all they needed to do now was boot up the game engine, swap a few sprites around and voila, game number two. However, this new approach of exploring the world as you saw fit, buying upgrades, chatting to locals was indeed a huge step towards a Castlevania style that we all know and love today. Sure, it hasn't exactly aged all that well, and in most people's eyes, it's nothing compared to the original, but it was still an important step in the right direction. And of course, it got probably the most important port of this entire franchise. The Tiger LCD game, which came in quite a few variants. Not one, not two, but three. Rock on! And yeah, it's as good as you are expecting. But regarding the original, did they follow suit with Castlevania 3? Well, you're just going to have to wait and see, because back then, Konami decided to jump to the arcades again for the first true Castlevania arcade video game. Haunted Castle. Who's up for more of that original Castlevania? The ultimate version of the game that appeared on the Famicom and MSX as it was promoted on the arcade flyer. Because of this, the game is often referred to as a remake of the original, but again, it's not. 
Actually, the game started its life as a completely different game, but six months in, due to short staffing, the game was in terrible shape, which is when the head of Konami stepped in and forced a sprite swap of the game to fit in with the Castlevania series. He brought in people who were working on the game Hot Chase, and only after one or two months, Haunted Castle was finished. If you've heard of the game before, then it's unlikely that it was spoke about in a positive light. The music is awesome, the art style is... it's okay. Everything is there, it's just... it just doesn't fit the Castlevania style if you ask me. It's not a terrible game, it's a hard game. A hard game that unlike the others in the series, feels unfair. A game I hardly ever play and when I do, I remember why that is. <laughs> With that said, it does have an absolutely stunning PlayStation 2 collector's set, complete with walkthrough DVDs, music CDs, and so much more. It's an expensive one, and besides the new Switch collection, this is still, in my opinion, the version to own. Haunted Castle is a slog, and really only worth your time and effort if you are, yet again, a hardcore fan. Just like Castlevania The Adventure on the Game Boy. And don't worry, we will soon get to number 3 because this Game Boy game came out literally weeks before the third entry in the original NES trinity. Konami's Castlevania The Adventure for Nintendo's Game Boy. In the maze of vampire scripts and unearthly evils, it is about to sink its fangs into you. This game takes us back a whole century before the original, where you play as Christopher Belmont, an ancestor to the legendary Simon Belmont, who is about half as slow and really doesn't have a whole lot to do. <laughs> My god, is this game long? It's incredibly boring compared to what came after. The game was being produced at the same time as the third entry, and although we do not know who worked on the game, what we do know is that whatever third-party company did tackle this first true handheld Castlevania release didn't really know what they were doing. The game simply just does not have any real charm that makes the original so great. It's long, it's tedious, the controls are very, very stiff, and it's just a real slog. Thankfully for Konami, they released it at the right time because having that Castlevania name and, of course, the Dracula name in Japan on the front cover helped it sell really, really well. In fact, according to Konami, it sold 2.5 million units, which resulted in a Game Boy Color re-release, several ports, a sequel, which we will get to in a bit, and a WiiWare exclusive remake, which was part of the Rebirth series. Now, if we are going to be jumping ahead again, not only does this WiiWare title look beautiful by comparison, I mean, obviously, it was released 20 odd years later for a console and not a handheld, but calling this a remake, well, it technically, again, isn't. Sure, the story in the title is for the most part the same, but the gameplay, the level design, heck, even the music is different here. It has similarities, but really it feels like its own game, and that's nothing but a good thing. Just like all the older Rebirth games, this one got great reviews, and GameZone even ranked it as the 10th best Castlevania ever. And as we get further along in this video, you will soon see why that is a big, big deal. It's a tough one to play nowadays, being that it was a download-only game for the Wii, which is obviously no longer available. But if you do somehow manage to play this, somehow, I can't possibly imagine how you would ever do that, then I highly suggest that you do. One of the best unknown games that we will be covering today. Right, let's move on, shall we, from those digital-only games that ruin this beautiful collection and talk about that third game in the original NES trilogy, cleverly titled Castlevania III Dracula's Curse. And regarding the plot, this is the last time I'm going to bring it up because it gets so crazy from here on out. Maybe I'll do it in its own video.
because even though this is a number three titled game, which was actually the sixth game released in the series, it actually is yet again another prequel to the original, but it doesn't go back as far as the adventure and eventually future titles too, making this whole timeline incredibly messy. So let's dust off the old Famicom and boot up this bad boy, shall we? For fans of the original styled Castlevanias, I personally think that this is the game to play. It ditches the RPG-like elements of the second game, and it takes it back to its roots with plenty of noteworthy upgrades, making it my favourite on the system. It's still Castlevania through and through, the difficulty is here, the learning of the enemy patterns, the fantastic music, but in this one you have extra characters. Yep, this game gives you the ability to play as different people on the fly, which actually changes up the gameplay a significant amount. And yes, this was the first game where we got to play as Alucard. As stated, each character plays differently and you will need to learn when the best time is to use each character and what items you want to collect along the way for when you want to use them. So is that it? Is it just a whole lot of refinements that make Castlevania 3 the best of the bunch? Yes and no. Obviously they had their previous entries to work on, but just like the original, they took inspiration from all of the best Universal monster flicks. However, this game actually took inspiration from something completely different. Well, kind of. Yes, it was 1989 and my god, 1992 by the time it was released in Europe that the Konami produced Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was by far the most successful game that Konami had ever pumped out on the NES. Because of this, the team that made this game was the standard to beat by all other in-house Konami teams and Hitoshu Akamatsu and his crew were obviously no exception. Castlevania 3 is so good because it learned from its mistakes and it did whatever it could, taking inspiration from the Turtles NES game with the desire to absolutely smash it from existence. Did it succeed? Not in my opinion, but it made Castlevania 3 a better game regardless. That said, Castlevania 3 Dracula's Curse is seriously hard. They seem to have ramped up the difficulty to the extreme degree and using the help me cheat is pretty much a necessity. That is unless you pick up the Japanese version of the game which is by far the best one to play. It's apparent almost instantly just how much the game was doctored for the western release. The enemies no longer take more damage depending on how far you are in the game. When you die, you go back a reasonable amount and, of course, the music is way, way better. And the reason for this was because the Japanese release included the VRCVI sound chip that added two extra square wave sound patterns for the designers and the difference definitely shows. This final release on the NES takes Castlevania and goes out with a bang. Sure, these games are hard, probably too hard for newcomers that want to casually check them out, but by this point, they had set the groundwork for what is without a doubt some of the most important steps of the 8-bit era. And I think it's fair to say that if it wasn't for these original titles, we simply would not have the games that came after it. And come on, who doesn't want to win a trip to Dracula's hometown? Now when looking back through this original trilogy with retrospective goggles on, it's easy to see them as nothing but surefire hits. And yes, it did have hardcore fans that bought every single entry in the original trilogy, but surefire hit? Not in the eyes of Konami. Because back in the day, did that original trilogy sell well? Well, yeah, they sold okay, but not to the levels of Leonardo and his crew. Each entry after the original ended up actually doing worse than the game that came before it. Even Jurin Kochi, another game created by Akamuso-san, did well in its reviews, but ended up being underwhelming in regards to its sales according to Konami. And because of this, after the release of that now legendary third game that many believe is arguably the best of the original trilogy being released countless amounts of times, 
Because it sold worse than even the Game Boy travesty, Konami was done with the man that started the Castlevania franchise. This was sadly commonplace back then. Many of Konami's early developers would find their sequels just didn't exactly make the money that the originals did, you know, for obvious reasons. And even though these were the games that the management forced them to make, they were obviously not very happy with the results. And one by one, these absolute legends of video gaming history would get demoted and Akamutsu-san was no exception. He and his team were responsible for starting one of the most legendary game franchises of all time, and only a few years later, he got put into a random Konami run arcade and he eventually quit. A lot of other developers in the same boat would end up working at Square Enix, but Akamutsu san didn't. Rival companies wouldn't even know who created these legendary titles as Konami never allowed to have their developers names be in the credits in fear of their rival companies swooping in and taking them away. And although we don't know exactly what happened to Hitoshi Akamatsu, many believe that he was no longer a part of the video game industry due to his name never popping up again. Two years later. After a two year break, the legendary Dracula 2 as it was known in Japan and Castlevania 2 Belmont's Revenge for the rest of the world found its way onto the Game Boy. This one is not associated with or to be mistaken for Castlevania 2 on the NES but instead this one is actually a follow up to the rather mediocre original Game Boy game. Thankfully this title does everything better and I do mean everything better. Even the original soundtrack which was great in this one, again it was better. And it doesn't stop there. The game has better level layouts, tighter controls, better graph… ok the graphics are mostly the same. But where it may look similar to what came before it on the Game Boy, it actually feels far closer to that original NES trilogy. A worthy addition to the franchise that you most definitely do want to be picking up. Although keep in mind that the game does play slightly different depending on what version you grab. Originally Nintendo's stiffy for censorship was raging during these games western releases as it changes the character's secondary weapon, another improvement over the original, from a cross to an axe. Annoyingly this actually changes up the pattern of the weapon too compared to the original Japanese release but thankfully the Konami GB Collection Volume 4 fixes this and also bumps the game up with colour. And by the way, just to make it even more confusing for you, even though Volume 1 which has the colour version of the adventure is the same in both regions, Volume 4 in Europe which has that colour version of Belmont's Revenge is Volume 3 in Japan. <laughs> Moving on. Moving on indeed because it's time to stop jumping from game to game to game to game and instead we are now going to be finished with the original NES or Famicom if you prefer video games. Yes, the 16 bits are finally here. So for you people out there waiting for me to talk about Super Famicom or the Super Nintendo games, now is the time with Super Castlevania 4. And nope, it isn't the fourth in the series or even a continuation of the story of number three, which again if you remember is actually a prequel. It's yet again another remake or a reimagining if you will of the original Castlevania. Seriously? Again? It was during the creation of both the Game Boy game and the third Castlevania for the NES that this game started its development. The theme you can hear here in the background is taken from the hit Japanese TV drama called Kito no Kuni Kara, and one of the main fictional characters in the show is Jun Fureno, which just so happens to be the name of the main programmer for this 16-bit wonder. Was it just an alias because Konami never let their developers use their real names in the game credits? Masahiro Uno, to give this legend his real name, had already proven himself to be quite the reliable employee at Konami. Working on such titles as Track and Field 2 and converting Metal Gear from the MSX to the NES in no more than three months and uh, yeah, that series turned out alright didn't it? Oh, 
それは世にも恐ろしい As it is now the dawn of the 16 bits, this was not only Castlevania's first entry in the series for the new generation, it was also Unio san's first ever 16 bit title. He was a huge fan of that original game, as were most people, and got to work as early as 1989. Obviously, the Super Famicom wasn't released by this point, and the team didn't even have the development unit to work with. All they had was the specs of what would be in it, and they used this to work out the new limitations of what they could do with the upcoming hardware. Maps were drawn out over and over, and when they did eventually get the dev kits, they had double, triple, and quadruple checked this so much that they not only did it rather quickly, but they were already finding new ways to improve the level design on the fly. And the main way they achieved all of this was, say it with me, Mode 7. The new features that the 8th Super Nintendo mode known as Mode 7 allowed for really did help make this new game feel like a next-gen experience. Shorter graphics and insane amounts of polish definitely help showcase this gothic masterpiece, but those Mode 7 graphics, wow! You always hear Nintendo fanboys going on and on about them, and after you play a game like this, it's obvious why. In a close space inside the rotating cylinder, Parts of the wall suddenly collapse and animals pop up from the debris. These never seen before graphics and this innovative way to make enemies appear using this new 3D effect are the selling points of the game. <laughs> Don't you just love design documents? Sure, this is yet another remake, whether you like to admit that or not. In fact, here is a quote from Masahiro Yuno himself from Retro Gamer confirming this very thing. I consider Castlevania 4 as a remake of the original Castlevania to some extent. See? I told you. Thankfully, the mixture of tried and tested gameplay mechanics with new gameplay and visual styles, sometimes on the fly ideas from both the creative artists and the programmer's own experiments, created something that actually feels more like its own thing. The way you can whip diagonally and wiggle it about was something they wanted to do originally in the first game, and finally got it implemented here. The way the fourth boss actually changes in size depending on how much you attack him is something that may look a little standard today, but at the time, it was impressive. Super Nintendo impressive, in fact. And finally, the ability to be able to jump onto stairs is something that fans have been crying about since the early days, and for good reason. No longer do stages feel crazy long, it chucks so many incredible ideas your way that it's never a slog. One minute you'll be fascinated by the spinning room, and the next you'll be working out ways to dodge whatever clever obstacle the team had sent your way. Super Castlevania 4 is often thought to be the best of the entire series, and I can understand why. It is so perfectly refined, it's stunning even 29 years later. The music takes what the originals did and makes perfect use of the Super Nintendo's excellent sound chip. It really is the whole package, a game that's full of gimmicks that you welcome with open arms, and yes, it sold rather well. Still, that didn't stop several members who worked on this game, along with members who worked on Castlevania 3, to up and leave and start the video game company Treasure, did it? Nope. It's fair to say that Castlevania was becoming more and more of a household name, and with Konami's seemingly endless amounts of teams waiting for what to do next, the order was sent down from the money-hungry men up top to make more Castlevania games, goddammit, and that's exactly what they did. We already mentioned the release of the Sharp X68000 version, but this wasn't the end of Konami's jumping around antics to different systems. In fact, they'd already seen success releasing games on the PC Engine and the PC Engine CD attachment add-on. 
releasing such classics as Gradius 1 and 2, Salamander and Snatcher. And now, it's time for Rondo of Blood. This really is the renaissance period for the series, isn't it? For those that don't know, Rondo of Blood is often thought to be one of the best, if not the best, Castlevania ever released, up there with such titles as Symphony of the Night, the original, and of course, Super Castlevania 4. Why is it so good? Well, for starters, it's often looked at as being one of the final games in the original Castlevania style of gameplay, before the whole Metroidvania style took over. And because it is this far along, well, they've completely refined that style of gameplay. Gone was the wiggly whip that Castlevania was known for, sadly. But in its place came branching paths. This was obviously first implemented in Dracula's Curse for the original NES, but obviously it was perfected here. The game was being worked on at the same time as the upcoming Mega Drive slash Genesis release and that Sharp X68000 game, and as it was one of the first games in the series to be created on CD, the team wanted to make sure to implement not only a kick-ass soundtrack, but also animated cutscenes and graphical elements that would make use of this new technology. The game features two playable characters, although four was originally planned, and these were added as a way to offer a hard and an easy mode, without actually giving the player that option. For newcomers, Maria is the way to go, but for hardcore Castlevania veterans, Richter is the obvious choice. The game is simply stunning, with its smooth character movements and overall anime aesthetic. It was so good, in fact, that the majority of noteworthy 2D Castlevanias after it took heavy inspiration from this game's look and style for their future releases too, as you will soon see. It's one of the first Castlevanias that made me want to go through and play again to discover all of those branching paths, taking that total number of levels from 8 to 13. Unfortunately, playing the game wasn't all that easy for us Westerners as a disagreement between NEC's US distribution and Turbo Technologies halted the release of this game outside of Japan, making this one of the most expensive entries to get hold of. The game wouldn't see the light of day officially, in fact, until the 2007 PSP remake was put out called Castlevania The Dracula X Chronicles which was a 2.5D remake of the Rondo of Blood game that also featured the original, at long last, and some other random PS1 game called, um, Symphony of the Night? <laughs> Whatever that is. Now getting far along enough to actually unlock these things is a bit of a pain, but as 2.5D remakes go, this was actually a pretty good one. I'm sure we can all agree that the pixelated 2D style of the original probably looks better, but it's still a fantastic game and a must own for the PSP if you can find it. And not to keep going on and on about it, but <laughs> the soundtrack is freaking awesome. Something I am going to be continuing harping on about for the rest of this video. When it comes to Castlevania, it's pretty much a standard. If you're sitting there watching a film or some random YouTuber whilst playing one of these excellent games, you're taking away so much of the experience. Don't do it. Unless it's my channel. To get fully absorbed into the game, you need to slap on a pair of charged up bass heavy headphones and sink into everything Castlevania. To be fair, that's something that's important to remember for all entries, but damn. I am even boring myself by this point, but the music in Rondo of Blood is just so, so good. The game was put out by Koji Igarushi after his game Symphony of the Night was released, as fans outside of Japan were desperate to find out why your character starts his journey at the beginning of the stairway to Dracula in that game. So yeah, spoiler alert for those that don't know, Symphony is a sequel to Rondo. Castlevania The Dracula X Chronicles was Iga's way to finally tell that story. Right, we've jumped about quite a bit here now, haven't we? And, well, I haven't been entirely honest with you guys. We did kind of get a port of Rondo of Blood back in 1995. We got 
Dracula X in the States, Vampire Kiss in the UK, and Akamujo Dracula XX or double X if you prefer in Japan. <laughs> Let me explain. NEC's North American staff struggled hard with the TurboGrafx-16 in the States, the Western version of Japan's more popular PC engine. Sure, you had the mighty Nintendo that they needed to go up against, but you know, that didn't stop Sega back then, did it? Sega! The PC engine was popular in Japan not only because of its small, sleek design, but more importantly, because of its games. Ask any hardcore collector for the system and you will soon see just how many incredible games this small or big, depending on your region, system had. But in the West, no matter how much NEC, who were responsible for getting it into the hands of American gamers, pushed the Japanese bosses to localize games in the West, it almost never happened. In the eyes of Japan, us Westerners liked two types of games, shooters and RPGs. Rondo of Blood was just not one of these types of games, and no matter how much Jonathan Brandstetter would plead with the big wigs, giving them lists of games, 10 to 15 long in some cases, that he had researched would do brilliantly in the States, he would normally get about one or possibly two. This over-the-top hand-holding made it so that this system had more top-quality games than average or below-average games, but at the same time, it missed out on some of the very best games ever released. And in an interview with Gamer Sutra, he had this to say regarding Rondo of Blood specifically. Have you ever played that game? That would have made a huge difference. It sold like crazy over here in the grey market. It's almost like you can sit there watching paint dry. It's like you're telling them what will make money and they just don't. And it's proven. Look, here's Sega. They're doing things. Here's Nintendo. They're doing things. See what they're doing? If we just do what they're doing, we'll make money. And that doesn't make sense to them. And you know what? He wasn't wrong. Whilst hardcore gamers for the time knew a guy that knew a guy that knew a guy that could get you a pirated copy of Rondo of Blood for the TurboGrafx-16 CD-based add-on, to the Konami execs up top in Japan, it didn't matter because we got a port two years later for the Super Nintendo, sadly. And I say that in the loosest sense. Pushing all of this onto one of those cartridge things is a, <laughs> well, it's an impossible task. So what we got instead was not really a sequel, not really a remake. The game is a toned down version of what it was copying with obviously lower quality music, fewer branching paths, practically none actually, no longer being able to play as Maria, slightly wonkier and slower controls, and mostly redesigned levels that were perfect to begin with and sadly for the most part, rather annoying now. Now, the game isn't bad, it's just average. It just loses a few extra points because the original is so, so much better. And even though the game is pretty much universally panned because it is a Castlevania game, it's now garnered a pretty astronomical price if you want a boxed copy. And yes, because of the name change, the remake was obviously called Dracula X Chronicles. <laughs> Keeping up. It ended up coming out right near the end of the Super Nintendo's life, and because of that, it had a low print run, and yes, it's now stupidly expensive. As is the new generation in the UK, Bloodlines in America, and Vampire Killer in the Land of the Rising Sun. Nintendo had most gaming companies by the balls. If you had been releasing games for Nintendo systems before the boom that was the Genesis in the States, then you would have already signed a contract that stated that you simply could not port these games onto Sega's 16-bit wonder. Whilst many companies were stuck with this caged contract, Konami had a backup plan. They had the ability to port their already created arcade titles, such as Sunset Riders, with ease. And thank god they did. Konami put out some excellent titles for the Mega Drive, but uh, porting from the Super Nintendo? That wasn't an option. 
Factor 5 even bought a rather impressive demo of the Super Nintendo title running on Sega hardware to the Konami offices in the hope of porting it over, but was rejected not only because of this ironclad deal, but also because Konami had more teams under their belt that were pretty desperate to get involved with the Castlevania name. And one of those teams had just finished up Batman Returns on the NES, and up next, they had their eyes set on everything Sega. Vampire Killer as it was known in Japan takes even more heavy inspiration from not only Bram Stoker's Dracula novel, but also another early 1990s novel that featured a female vampire. As this game didn't actually bear the Akamujo Dracula name, the team were able to go just a tad further with its gothic tone, promoting it originally as its own game entirely. In fact, one of the first times it was promoted was at the back of the Rondo of Blood strategy guide where it was referred to as Castlevania Gaiden. This is the game all of you Console Wars people out there need to get. Yes, it's 10 times better than Vampire Kiss or Dracula X, whatever you want to call it. But some people even think that the Mega Drive Castlevania is better than Super Castlevania 4. Because even though I am a hardcore fan of everything Sega, I do not put myself into this group. I still prefer the Super Nintendo game, mainly due to the controls, but you can see where people are coming from with the new generation. This proved that Konami during the 90s could easily take on any system they desired, both Castlevania Bloodlines and Number 4 included gimmicky designs that did more than just be a gimmick. The teams at Konami pushed the systems to their limits and this 16-bit wonder was no exception. It's yet again hard, but as the games got closer and closer to that 32-bit era, they started to feel more fair with every single entry. Hey guys, thanks for checking out part one of the complete history of Castlevania. Yes, this has taken a long time to make. As stated, part two is already available for Patreons and YouTube members, so go and check that out if you wish. Links can be found in the description. But before we go ahead, let's give some big, big shout outs to firstly Quang for lending me the incredible collection you've seen all the way through this video and you're going to be seeing throughout the second video as well. And uh, let's give some shout outs to the people that actually provided their voices for this very video. Uh, John Riggs, Adam Korolik, uh, Akatimo64 provided some of the footage for the handheld section. Um, we've got Larry Bundy Jr., Control, uh, Control Alt Reese, and Wrestling with Gaming. All of their channel links can be found down in the description. And also, if you enjoyed the music of this particular video, then please do go and check out all of the composers, the remixes, and everything in between, also down in the description. But right now guys, I want to give a massive shout out to all of the Patreons and YouTube members that actually help me create videos like this every single week. They take an incredible long, uh, 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 an incredible amount of time, and if it wasn't for these incredible people, I wouldn't be able to do it. So, a big thanks goes to Aaron Gorman, Andrew Dalton, uh, Benjamin Guy, Andrew Ward, Big Rico, Bram Perez, Brandon Gold, Chris the Rottweiler, Clan Bob, Conrad Constantine, Control Alt Reese, uh, Daniel Terrares, David Yaron, Dina, Dominic Devonport, Game Apologists, Gary Pinkett, Hutt, Intrigued Gaming, Jay is Manchild, Jay, Jabba Al Aiden, Jacob P, aka Avalon Janes, Jeff Ladd, Jeff Mianowski, Jeremy Rodriguez, Jonathan Hayward, King Link Reviews, Lucas Softail, Lipped, Man Shovel, Marcus Kingimo Cut Tyndall, Nicholas Burtner, Nick Pollard, Petty New, uh, Pretendo 64, Roll Van Proegen, uh, RetroReversing.com, Retro to Next Gen, aka Lou, Richard Aldergic, Richard Carter, aka Fantastic Dizzy, Rovan Army, Ryan Holtz, Sashi Dog, Shadow Dragon, Solid's Captor, Taylor Rainwater, Tim Labonte, Tim Lunn, Todd Paul Float G, Wobbles and Bean, The Wonder Ducks, Ye Old Hamburglar, Nightwill, Kevin Heaton, Dina81, 
Shade Silence, Ag uh, Agnesio, Jesus, Creato, Caracido, Mind of the Unsane, Trans Rights, hmm, Michael Towns, Cremilla, Cheshire One, Vikeko, The Shady J, Rocket Pod, The Cunning Linguist, Arista, Man of God 9000, That Gamer, and Samuel Nilsson. That threw me off. I normally have them in alphabetical order and I didn't do it for this video. Thank you all, regardless, for supporting the show, however you decide to do it, whether you share my videos on social medias and reddits and places like that, all of that sort of thing really does help the show. I hope you enjoyed this video, it took an incredibly long time to create, and um, I hope you're all just staying safe out there, and uh, I hope you are enjoying the content. For now, this is DJ Slope signing out, and hopefully I'll see you all next time. Thanks guys, bye bye.